Hello, hello, it's Sonny Melendrez, and welcome to the positive side of the radio spectrum. This is the all-new Sonny Melendrez Show. Every week, we strive to bring you inspiration and entertainment through storytelling, fascinating guests, celebrity interviews, and so much more, all delivered with lots of enthusiasm. And we come to you from our beautiful studios located deep in the heart of Texas, San Antonio, the birthplace of hospitality. And now, on with the show. The year is 1927. In the rural town of Spur, Texas, Gladys and Willie McCombs welcome their first child into the world. Times are hard. The couple gets by on very little. And yet it was their abundance of love and generosity that would have a lasting effect on Billy Joe Red McCombs. Today, 91 years later, Red has become a Texas icon, having built one of the country's biggest automotive companies, and along with his loving wife Charlene, has donated more than $130 million to Texas schools, research institutions, and nonprofits. You would think this man has nothing else to prove. Think again. It is my honor and pleasure to visit with my friend Red McCombs. And Red, I want to start out by asking you to tell me about your parents. My parents were fun-loving, cheerful parents of four children, kind of in a row. And I was the eldest. And my dad was running a shop for a Ford dealer in Spur, Texas. They had three people working in the shop. And uh, my dad had come off the farm. All of his family had always been uh, in the sharecropping, uh, as was my other group of uh, grandparents. And uh, so I could get off in the weeds and all, but they were great people. They loved uh, they they loved uh, what they were doing. None of them had any money. Uh, I was uh, earning more money by the time I was. 12, 13 or so, then my father, uh, who made $25 a week, and the take out of that was was uh, 25 cents, so he brought home $24.75 each Saturday night. My mother promptly took another uh, little uh, envelope and put $2.50 out of the stack and took it to the First Baptist Church the next morning. So I lived in an atmosphere to where uh, I've told several reporters, like, what was the most important thing to you growing up? I said, it'd be hard to say, but uh, I would say the depth with which my father loved my mother Mm. was probably more impelling to me than anything else I saw. Times were tough. Nobody had any money. So you weren't a standout in any way. You you were like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Uh, But more than that, they didn't have much hope because they'd seen the same thing go on for years. And uh, that's what sharecropping is. So uh, I bounced out... uh, and uh, my mom let me hitchhike to uh, Austin when I was 16, and uh, my life changed forever. How's that? Because I found in the Union, the Texas Union uh, Club on campus that had the big board of notes, people leaving messages for each other, uh, I spent two days just reading those messages that students were leaving for each other. And I was convinced that the whole world turned right there. Mm. And uh, if you could if you could handle that, you could handle all of it. And, of course, that was rather naive. Uh, but uh, I never did change from that. And I still today, when I go on the campus in Austin, uh, I, I get... 
I, I get shivers hmm. because realizing what education means and the fact that there was so many ways to absorb it there right on that campus. So it was a jolly, uh, loving uh, kind of a thing for about five years, and the, the world changed. And and I don't think I changed. I, I think I stayed the same and, and got a little bit stronger in my conviction as to what it was all about. Well, you know, you've always been an entrepreneur. Uh, did you get that from your dad? No, my dad was... was uh, a, a master mechanic, he mastered every tech book that came in, but he never had much interest in managing other people and going in other forces and other places. Uh, he just wanted to take your car, mister, and uh, sit down over and have a Coca-Cola and some peanuts and I I'll have you running in about 30 minutes. <laughs> well, you know, in a way, that's the way it is with you. You've always been really focused on the customer first. In fact, on the always. way over here, I saw a billboard that yeah. said, my customer is the boss, just don't tell Charlene. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, because it's just that's the way it is. Uh, we were that way from all my life, and I'll be... 92 in a few months. Wow. Uh, and I won't be look as, as pretty as you and, and as smooth as you, but I'll be plodding along trying to catch you. God bless you. Well, you're driven. <laughs> I am driven. What, what, what gets you excited about waking up in the morning? The fact that God has allowed me another day, that's the greatest gift that we can get. And what we do with it is uh, pleasing to him is what he wants, that you do something that makes a difference. And uh, that never changes. Uh, I don't look at it as, a, as something that is boresome or, or you need something else. I know that God will put in my, in, in my place of the 14 to 18 hours that I'm up, in a day, many opportunities. Mm. And uh, I, I pick some and uh, have to bypass some. But I think that is such a gift. And then you, when you realize how personal it is, it's not only such a gift as I indicate, but no one in the world will ever have your fingerprint. So God made you special. And when some... People laugh and say, oh, well, everybody's special. Well, everybody is special. And they're special to their, if they're special to their own fingerprint. And the billions of people worldwide will never have that fingerprint. Mm. I think that's a pretty good indication that he loves you and he wants you to do well. Yeah. And help other people uh, that need your help. So, uh my world doesn't change much from there. It's been to me a joyful run, and uh, I hope that he sticks a few more years on it. Oh, I know he will. I know he will. You know, we're sitting here in your office, and I want to paint a picture for our, our listeners. Uh, we can see all the way to downtown. A little cloudy today, but it's just a beautiful view that you have here. Actually, when you sit at your desk, you're actually looking at the skyline of our beautiful city. That's so beautiful. Isn't it incredible? I know he, I know he did it for me. <laughs> but I want to I want to ask you about your relationship with uh, with San Antonio. Now take me back to the years when we were talking about hemisphere and getting everything going. I heard about a conversation you had with Lee Iacocca. Remember that? Yeah, well I had a lot of them. Well, this one was about uh, maybe getting a sponsorship for the Hemisphere. Well, we had to have uh, to satisfy the Bureau of of uh, Expositions, which headquartered out of uh, Paris. Mm -hmm. We had to have uh, some twenty eight exhibits that were built in new structures on the fairground and were be serviced 
uh, 14 hours a day, seven days a week uh, for six months. So it was quite an undertaking. And in going after it, Governor Connolly had asked me if I would take charge of it. And I found out very quickly that I couldn't get access, that San Antonio and its World's Fair and all that we were feeling so strongly about didn't mean anything to the Fortune 500 group. Mm. Uh, I mean, zero. And that was where I got the idea that if we want to, if we really want to do this, uh, we'll do this fair the best we can, but we will immediately, uh, we will find us a way to get an opportunity to get national recognition. Mm. And that national recognition came in the form of the American Basketball Association, which was broke, and nobody wanted to look at it. The mayor of Dallas told me that he would give it to me if I'd just do something with it because they were playing to about 250 fans there in Dallas. Mm. So uh, we had our work cut out for us, but I never doubted that that's what it was going to take. We couldn't do it through education. We couldn't do it through religion. Uh, we, We couldn't do it through philanthropy. We couldn't do it through taking care of all these soldiers coming through here. Mm-hmm. We had to we had to do it for the people of San Antonio, and I've always been a sports jock uh, and proud of it. And most everybody thought because I was such a sports jock that I wanted to get a, a major league sports team. Well, yes, I wanted to do that, but more than anything, I wanted San Antonio to be identified with the L.A.s and with the New Yorks and with the Philadelphias. Right. Uh, and we did. And we walked in, and they, they I'll never forget uh, uh, the guy that owned the Lakers at the time, and I became strong drinking buddies. <laughs> and he said, Red, you know, I love being with you and doing things with you, but you're never going to get in the NBA. Uh, they're not going to take you. Because you got a team that probably can beat us, mm. and, and we could we could stand Denver beating us, we could stand the Nets beating us. We can't stand San Antonio. That's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, he said, "I might as well just sell my, my all my tools and leave mm. if I were to have San Antonio Spurs in here and they kicked the Lakers." Yeah. Well, it was with great joys we waltzed in there with our little rowdy butts and kicked their butts. <laughs> what year was this? This was 73. And we were on the top by 75. Isn't that something? And it still gets bigger by the day. Yeah. Now, what about football? Football will be here, but it takes a lot of things to come together. It, it's kind of like a puzzle. And they all got to fit at one time. But that will happen. And uh, I, I, I learned... Uh, what it took to uh, get into a league, uh, which was impossible, because uh, who had the money? Uh, no one else really believed in it uh, at all, and I'm not putting them down, but they, they didn't really see that San Antonio was not going to be. We loved our little city with the river running through it, mm. but there weren't the people that were making decisions in the world were not looking at San Antonio. So we had to get we had to get identity. And you can't get it any more in the world than you can with sports teams. Because a sports team that's a, a great team regardless what type of sport or regardless how many titles they have, uh, they'll always be recognized. And we had to pull that off for San Antonio. We did. Mm-hmm. Uh, had a lot of help from all the media here uh, and had a lot of help from other teams in the league. But like the guy at, at the Lakers at the time, he said, you know, I'd love to be in something that you're involved in, Red, because you bring a lot of energy, you bring a lot of fun, bring new ideas. But I'm just telling you that that for the Lakers to take a team like San Antonio – 
and get beat would just be something I couldn't stand. <laughs> so I said, well, fine, help us in other ways. We'll find a way, and we will do that. So we moved f- from uh, that uh, first go-around. We moved, and in four years, we were in the NBA. And we played our first game in the NBA in Philadelphia. They were very generous. They partied uh, my family. Other people from San Antonio also Mm -hmm. went up, and we got into a game. There, their interest was in Dr. J because they had just purchased Dr. J from the Nets a week before the game. So obviously they were excited about getting him on their roster. And here comes this bunch of guys that nobody ever heard of until that night. And we went in. It was a great game. We went at 121 to 118. I ran into the dressing room, had to fight my way through the reporters. There were more reporters there than any championship game of anything <laughs> that I'd ever seen. And I'd go from place to locker to locker, uh, hugging my players, kissing my players, and we all were you, you just just out of our heads. Oh. And uh, a guy, uh, uh, one of the reporters, rightfully so, he did nothing wrong, but he was working from his notebook, and he said, hey, fella, you're making a hell of a lot of noise, and uh, we've got to get some information here. Uh, we're, we're trying to learn about Dr. J. And uh, I jumped up on the stool in the middle of the dressing room, and I said, we're glad you're here, and we'll, you'll be back here many more times. And he said, well, what have you got to do with it? And I said, everything, and you'll see that tonight. <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, we will be back. This won't be the only time we'll be in here. And I said, uh, uh, we're going to kick your guy's ass. That's what we're about. And uh, that's what the game is about. And he said, what? I said, hey, you can talk about Dr. J. You can talk about anybody you want to. But the San Antonio Spurs beat your team tonight, 121 to 118. (laughs) You can't do anything about that. (laughs) So we've had a lot of fun like that. People didn't know they were putting you down, uh, but they were. Mm -hmm. Uh, We didn't take for it. And when we got the team put together, which we put together in about three months, uh, we got lucky and got the Ice Man. And the Ice Man was a 20-year-old that hadn't even been to college out of Detroit. George Gervin. But he knew how to play that game. And I bought him for cash uh, from... uh, the club in Virginia that had him. And uh, I said, George, what do you think about coming to a little town like San Antonio? And he said, hey, big chief, he said, you get that TV, keep it going. Give me plenty in here to eat and drink. And he said, "Uh, I like it real good. (laughs) uh, So, he, you know, nobody even knew who he was because he hadn't played the big Mm -hmm. circuit and he hadn't played the big college circuit. Uh, but yeah, if you saw George play once, you'd know that wasn't accidental. No. Uh, he could do it. Uh, I asked him, I said, where did you learn that shot? And he said, I don't know. He said, you know, when I was growing up, my five brothers and sisters and I lived in two rooms. My wife, my mom lived in the other room. Hmm. My mom would get up at 530 in the morning. She'd fix something for all of us kids. And then she'd say, now, remember. You cannot close the street. He said, we were in a government project in downtown Detroit. And we, if we stayed within the block we were in, so that meant I could take those little worn-out basketballs and bounce them up against the building hmm. and practice shots, shots, practices, and that from five to five, hmm. from the time she left till the time she came back. And, uh, of course, he's in the Hall of Fame now. Uh, and rightly so. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and he still has a love for the game. I, I want to talk about your love for the Longhorns. 
the Longhorns like it in Austin or the Longhorns like I have on my ranch? <laughs> Both. Uh, the Longhorns in, in Austin. The Longhorns in Austin, uh, they represent, even though we have a lot of colleges and universities in the state of Texas, uh, most more people who are not identified with another school choose the University of Texas, and I'm glad that they do, because it gives us the power that we need to do things on an international basis. So uh, uh, we've earned that place, we've kept that place, and uh, we now are recognized at any place in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, you ask people about San Antonio, oh, Iceman, the San Antonio Spurs. Right. Oh, God, you guys got the best team. And we've been fortunate. We've been able to, to get others after George and stay, stay at the top as well as uh, get to the top. Yes, yes, there's no question about that. You know, you, you, you always have had this, this wonderful um, connection with people who, like you say, come across your desk, uh, people who, who opportunities. Um, a lot of people, they find themselves in a job where they're not the boss. What advice do you have to somebody who's wanting to, to, to get a, a better job, a better life, make something better for themselves? All you have to do is beat the guy next to you. You do better and do more than anybody else you're working with. You don't have to be prodded to do it. You look forward to do it. Every manager and owner of every business in the world is looking for that guy. And that guy is around, but many times he doesn't show himself. So they don't know that. But the opportunities are there, and you can do it. And if you come early and you stay late, first they're going to think, the other people you're involved with will think, well, they're trying to show off, or they know the boss's daughter, or this or that. It could be that and all the above. It doesn't matter. But whatever your assignments are, do them better than anybody else. Come early and stay late, and they're going to move you up. It's it just as certain as the fact that the sun's going to come up. Tell me about, about Charlene and how you... There is uh, only one Charlene. Uh, we've been married... Uh, 68 years. She was raised as a little wealthy girl in uh, Corpus Christi, but she's not she's not wealthy to anybody, but she's wealthy to everybody. Mm. And the, I met her in a in a college registration line, mm. and uh, I heard her say something that tied to something that I was aware of. What's that? And I just stepped out of line when she stepped out of line and said, well, could we talk about this? And she looked at me a little doubtful, and I said, uh, you've lived here, I haven't. Uh, let's just sit down here and talk a little bit. <laughs> and uh, she was not interested in me at all. Really? Not at all. So I used the trick that everybody's used, both <laughs> male and female. <laughs> I started dating other people and flaunting them in front of her. <laughs> then she got interested in me. <laughs> Maybe there is something to this guy. <laughs> 68 years. Right. So what's... I was 23 and she was 22. Wow. What's the secret to a long marriage? Respect each other and love each other. You're going to have differences and everything's not going to be smooth and easy. But you took vows, and God is looking right down at you. He intends for you to keep those vows. Now, you've got, I can see you've got a landline here. I don't see a cell phone anywhere. I don't use cell phones. I don't use computers. And at times I would like to, because I'm always looking for something more, more this, more that, or such. But at the other hand... My plate is so loaded that I have problems now really giving people time Mm. that I want to have time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to short Charlene 
because I'll get shorted and that'll be the end of that. <laughs> well, Red, I want to thank you for, for giving me uh, your time. And uh, uh, I, I, I look- Sonny, let me say this. You bring joy and hope and fulfillment to people in such a professional way. And you have access to so many. I've watched you for years and years. You're the kind of guy that God wants representing him. I'm glad you want this interview. I'm happy to give it to you. But you, you offer an awful lot yourself. Thank you, Red. Coming from you, it's, it's like an award. And may I say thank you to you for all you have done for our city, for the countless lives that you have touched and continue to serve. You are truly a Texas treasure. Well, that's my visit with Red McCombs. You can find out more about Red by visiting sunnyradio.com slash show. You'll also find a link to his Twitter account. I think you'll enjoy at sunnyradio.com slash show. You can also listen to past shows on demand. And don't forget to subscribe to my podcast so you don't miss a single episode. Till next time, I will leave you with this powerful thought from Mr. McCombs. The greatest joy you will ever find is giving it away. Bye-bye.